Welcome everybody uh, back to um, the Siegel talks here at the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center at the Graduate Center of CUNY in the City University of New York and in from Manhattan, the uh, city um, of uh, the state of New York, which is of course most, uh, most affected by the virus. Um, again, over a thousand dead people in the US uh, uh, yesterday and uh, Manhattan, as the New York Times reported, and New York has been uh, the epicenter. So many of the, the infections do travel through here. It's a town with uh, 12, 13, 15 million. We don't never really know how many people are here. Three, four, five million people that sub taking the subway every day. Um, 300,000 people coming out of uh, Penn Station every morning and going back. And we New Yorkers like to be together to talk, to touch, to dance, to enjoy life, go to bars and especially theater. It's a town that's connected in an identity also to theater and performance like perhaps no other town in the US and the United States. It's a fantastic uh, place and everything has changed. Uh, it's a full break. The car uh, is about to flip over uh, here it's uh, in the US. Uh, again, I think 3 million people uh, filed for unemployment. There are over 30 million people, 32, 33 within four or five weeks. Um, it's unimaginable what happened. Uh, and we all don't know how can a country survive? Uh, how will people survive? And our healthcare workers and people in old age homes, people who do God's work and the uh, uh, homeless shelters, um, there is, there's a severe stress in families and, uh, uh, and of course also in the artistic community. Our, some playwrights, we play, talked with Blackfest, they said their families are actually making wills. They feel that they haven't done that. They sit around, support each other. They say, we do not know how we will survive this. Traditionally, we haven't had a hard time in this country. We are the first one again who are on the line um, as the people who live more on the on the outskirts on the margins and um, we do not get the help we need and now people look at us because there are higher numbers of diabetes or others which is you know just by dna but they are looked at as people who potentially you know uh, uh, um, uh, uh, have an impact uh, on a, uh, on a healthy neighborhood so it's, it's a terrible situation we heard from uh, romania um, this week uh, of uh, thousands of workers who cannot come back, thousands who want to go out and be seasonal workers without any mask. Uh, we heard a devastating account again from India um, yesterday where four, 500,000 people tried to leave New Delhi on the streets, walking with their kids and their suitcases and that the artistic community really tries hard uh, to help. And they actually really do that. They say this is what they can do at the moment. And um, and places from Hungary, where um, we heard, you know, that Orban, in his wisdom, the president said, "Every sixty percent of our people have to leave hospitals, uh, terminally ill people. Many of them died on the streets, basically on the transports home, and um, next to political repressions, they created a system where um, they can basically uh, implement any law, any degree, without a discussion. It's a, a terrible time in the world. It's a crisis, but of course, a crisis." in theater also means uh, something is changing. So it's on the boiling point, but something will happen. Maybe this all already has happened. We don't know yet uh, as revolutions, when they really happen, something has already happened before. And uh, there's a great German poet who I admire very much, Holderlin, who said, if there's danger, that what save us will also grow or is already growing, but we don't see it. But I think this is the same here. So theater and the arts have played an important role always in societies, artists have been on the right side of history, the right side of justice, the right side of social progress, and we have to listen to them. We should have listened to them earlier. They detected this, they warned us with plays about social and uh, problems, about uh, the race problems, about uh, unemployment, uh, about disenfranchised minorities and climate change, especially the very big thing hanging over us. Maybe this is just the overture as many artists said. And um, so as theater artists um, have significant uh, uh, insight and they are also the one who help us to change, to imagine new worlds, different worlds, to come to terms with different worlds and to find out it's okay maybe what they show on stage. Yeah, that's not so bad. I don't have to live the way we lived uh, before. And uh, it's great to live with uh, people from all around the world who enjoy their culture, but also um, you know, maybe reinforcing local traditions to work locally, but think global, globally. And today we have two representatives of the American theater scene 
who often also are not in the spotlight in IFPL, they should. Uh, we have with us uh, Stacy Klein, who uh, founded and works at the Double Edge Theater in Western Massachusetts, um, which is outside on a rural area where they work and create and teach, perhaps connected a bit to an Eastern European experience, one of the few places that successfully does that. They have a company, an ensemble, and also with us is Stephanie uh, Monceau from the um, New York City Bendel's their family circus, a circus community that is slowly growing. We had a big day at the Siegel Theater. It's a significant art form, a form I very love very much. I think it should be more in the center of attention, perhaps also has enters, answers in the great uh, tradition of popular theater. I remember the funeral of Heiner Müller, um, and a German um, speaker said you know, his last talk, Enzensberger, was that with Heiner Müller, was that the Berlin Ensemble was built on the ground where the circus was in Berlin. Well, People put up the tents, the circus, and then it became a bigger stable theater. And he said, we have lost something. And that's what Hannah Muller felt. We have to also to connect to ways. So there's a great movement in France, uh, the great uh, Cirque Nouveau movement with over four, 500 companies existing, living, making a living. It's a great tradition. And so now we are checking in with um, our, our friends here who do, took the time to talk to us, talk to you, to and to, we can listen to them. So to hear what is happening in, um, in your worlds, maybe we'll start with Stacy. Stacy, where are you exactly? I know I said upstate New York in the days the before. I apologize, it's Western Massachusetts, but what town? And describe a little bit the setting of your work. I'm in Ashfield, Massachusetts, and Ashfield is a town of 1,700 people. And um, we are a direct democracy. We are one of very few direct democracies in the United States. Um, we are part of the Hilltown communities of Franklin County, um, which is the poorest or second poorest county in uh, Massachusetts, largely due to its rural nature, um, big farming taking over. So, um, we are in a struggling, extremely vibrant place in Ashfield. Um, and yet we have um, three um, kind of community gathering places in Ashfield. Um, the entire county comes to Ashfield to Double Edge and to, um, to other things going on here. It's a very um, tight knit community right now. And we have had one case of COVID in um, Ashfield since this started in March. One case uh, confirmed or, uh, uh, or fatality? Um. No, one case that um, she recovered. She re recovered for direct democracy. Can you tell a bit more what you mean? So we are, we don't have a party system. We don't have a mayor. We have um, town meetings and we agree and vote on things directly. Um, so we are responsible for our own set of laws and regulations and budgets. Um, I think it's a really incredible example of what local um, politics can be and an example for the country of the difference that local politics could make. And this is very old. It started in the 1600s like this and um, it, it has continued since then resisting the um, party system which has taken over almost every place except the hill towns of Massachusetts and some New England states. And how does your theater fit in? It's, it's, tell us a little bit where it's set. I think it's on a farm. I have unfortunately haven't been able to come out yet, even though you invited me, of course, you have been at the Siegel, but tell us a little bit, where does that fit in and how does it look like? So we came, um, Double Edge was founded in 1982, almost 40 years old. Um, we came here in 1994 um, to have a, we, we bought a farm and it was a farm that the farmer had been trying to sell the farm for 10 years because 
it's a 105 acre farm, very, very difficult to sell large farms um, at that time. So um, we got it and were tasked by the farmer with just grow something here. Um, so we elected to grow theater, um, but we also actually have um, came here so that we could be sustainable and um, autonomous and grow our own food and um, live in an environmentally sustainable way, um, as well as making theater. Um, so we, um, we just came here because of the economics of making theater in the city um, in an ensemble were too much. We were supporting eight people. Um, and we had guest artists from all over the world at the time, particularly from Central Europe. So we couldn't really afford to even house people in Boston. Um, so we came here to try to work and then realized that we had to do more than just work here and be isolated from the community, that that wasn't going to work and we weren't sustainable. We didn't know anything about how to live in a rural community. So we really needed the community. And so we started actually doing theater here, gave up our space in Boston. And um, today is a whole other story. Um, we're very, very integrated with our community. Um, and they've perhaps uh, helped save us um, in this situation when we were, um, our tour, three month tour was canceled uh, at the beginning of it on March. Beginning of this March year. March 12th, yeah. Um, we had to come home. We were devastated. Um, Where was the tour supposed to go? We were going to, we were in Albuquerque. Um, we were going to California. We were going to, Detroit, um, we were going to Washington, and we were going to England and um, Norway. Um, yeah. All that was canceled. We came home. Um, I was more or less like, you know, I'm done. And then uh, our community really- You're done uh, meant you will have to close down shop, you meant? Yeah. I think so. Yeah, that's how I felt. Because you will um, support yourself through touring, your farm work and your being there is through touring. It was um, the bulk of what we were trying to do for this three months, which was going to support our year. Yes, um, not every year is the same at Double Edge, but this was something we planned for two years, this tour. Incredible. Um, so it was a pretty big deal. That's, that's, that's heartbreaking um, to hear and that the community came out. We will, we will, of course, come back to this. Thank you, Stacey. And again, it's interesting that in this direct democracy, there is a theater that, and we all say that when theater is alive, when theater is kicking, when theater is part of a community, it's a good sign for the city, for a country, for a state. And again, here, this proves it and wonderful that they, um, you know, feel that you are such an important part that they are supporting you. We will hear more, but now let's um, um, go to Stephanie. Stephanie, tell a little about uh, uh, where you are at the moment. I see you are in a costume shop and I see um, a hat and a mask and an iron, a little sewing machine behind you. Um, is, are you in a circus tent? I'm in a home, I'm in a, a little old hundred year old house in Hudson, New York, which is Columbia County. It's a mostly rural county south of Albany, the capital of New York, of, uh, New York State. Um, we border on the Berkshires. Uh, we are contiguous with, in terms of like a cultural region or, a, or an economic region, we're part of New York's capital district. Um, Bindle Stiff is kind of divided in activity between New York City and Columbia County at this point. Tell and us a bit about the history of you. You know it so well. Um, most of <laughs> it, even I didn't know about it before you came to the Seagull. Um, we did that big event on circus in the National Circus with Ruth Vickler Luker, who is a Toho, who uh, 
in Canada, um, and we did, but uh, so we to focus on what is existing in America, what's in Canada, how can that scene grow? And uh, you came, so tell a little bit about your New York City family circus. Bindlestiff started in 1994 when I met my partner, Keith Nelson, and the two of us uh, formed a fire eating duo. Um, at that time- what? We were Say again? Fire, we were eating fire in nightclub. Oh, okay. Okay, was, nightclub then, yeah. It was, uh, it didn't start out as a desire to go to Vegas. We were, you know, we were really performing ritual in, in um, and, and pushing, pushing taboos, uh, playing with gender roles and, um, and norms in terms of um, public behavior and just kind of um, pushing our bodies and fire was the, you know, is the transformative element, the dangerous element that really spoke to us at that time. And it, because of the kind of, of performances we were doing, um, in New York City at that time, um, mostly very underground clubs were permissive in terms of letting us do this stuff. So our yeah. our whole artistic, you know, roots are in the trans community, the drag community, the kind of fetish play playful fetish community, um, the the queer community, and the incredible kind of tableau vivant that were going on every night in all these these clubs really informed our aesthetic um, and the kind of things we wanted to talk about and the community that we, the family that we created. And so Bindlestiff's origins were very underground and we remained very underground for the, I guess, first 10 or 15 years of our um, performing and touring in New York City, but also nationally. Um, but then, you know, as we got older, members of our little family started to have families of their own. And, and we started to kind of make work that spoke more to youth and families and left some of the more kind of uh, boundary pushing stuff and taboo breaking stuff to move into, uh, a different realm but over the over these 25 years we've gotten to work with I, when i say hundreds i really literally they, we have a list somewhere there's over 400 artists that have kind of and many of them who come over and over who are kind of in our family tree and um some international ones as well so how does it work like you rent a tent and then you were uh, in the summer you play in a town or in new york i, I think it's close to impossible almost to do that in new york city but maybe you do so where do you perform and um and what do you show we started in non-traditional event i mean for as a circus and even as a theater company we we never performed in traditional venues from the very beginning we would in nebraska we found some kind of concrete outhouse in the middle of a cornfield to play in that some local person told us about in salt lake city it was a an art gallery um in san francisco it was a converted uh warehouse that had a bunch of artists living in it, it was always these spaces that artists had taken over um to make you know as 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 you're doing Stacy, with double edge, like to create a community around the kind of art they wanted to make. And they were welcoming of us who would, you know, come along and do our thing and keep moving. And, you know, there was this great um, cross, cross pollinization of, of creativity and ideas. And it was around circus. It just, it, it was a medium that spoke to a lot of us at the time um, because it seemed, I mean, we're, when you're coming along to something at 22 or so, you feel like you're inventing it or discovering it for the first time. And uh, we didn't realize how rich the kind of new circus scene in, in the US really was going back to the 60s and 70s with um, mm -hmm. kind of new comedia explorations, the Pickle family doing political, you know, political theater by the San Francisco mime troupe. Um, in New York City, Circus Amok doing really politically oriented yep. circus. Uh, public theater in the streets. And that's what that's what we were attracted to. So it was never about getting a tent or, you know, playing the new Vic. It's it was about bringing this medium to places where it had never been done before. And um, 
by you know by dint of being ignorant we we just kind of dumbly lucked into uh these places where we could play it and uh, you know because of the nature of who we are we love history we we love to read we collect lots of um you know literature about circus and vaudeville in the united states we began to see that we weren't inventing anything <laughs> that you know we're carrying on a tradition um but i i you know What's interesting, Stacy, is about what you were saying about how, you know, when when you're told you can't do this, it feels like the end of something. So, like for you, it was your tour. For us, it was the same thing. With the, you know, we have an annual New York City season, which this is our 25th anniversary, and we're now we're facing we can't do it. And how is the situation for circus artists or whoever in that field performance circus? on these kind of hybrid form. How, how, how is the situation for you? Well, what I want to say is what, what's coming out of that, you can't do this, is, is like we're forced to not do it and reevaluate what's going to come next. And a lot of the questions that are coming up in the circus community have to do with sustainable touring and the environment and is the model that we were relying on to you know, make money going to be doable in the future? And can we can we rationalize like flying to Iceland to collaborate with a company up there because they have money or something, you know, like, and so I, what it looks like is a, a much more locally focused model of creation and collaboration and reaching out to other, you know, artists and folks who are not necessarily in this medium to, to, uh, yeah. to stay alive. Is there any support? Do you know of any funding that comes to that group of circus performance or hybrid street theater, uh, however you, the term is right, what you would describe your word. Is there, are you getting help? We, you know, I was on a call yesterday with um, a dozen circus people from Gypsy Snyder to Mark Lonergan to um, uh, folks in the younger generation who are kind of like founding companies. And we're all asking these questions. One of the things is looking outside of traditional arts funding models in terms of foundation funding or you know donor and subscriber funding and partnering directly with municipalities. Like in Hudson, the the local common council has a tourism board and they're trying to figure out like how do we reopen our economy? Oh, the arts, you know, the arts and culture sector are attractive and will drive tourism, which drives, you know, and a lot of us who have this conflicting idea about what tourism does and how it gentrifies communities and you know marginalizes people even further you know there's a lot going on all in that one question of like where the money comes from yeah stacy tell us a bit what happened you said that your community uh helped or came through or what what exactly happened um, well, what happened was that um, in spite of us being in Ashfield for 26 years and developing all this, I, I really had no emotional idea about how tightly knit and how um, important Double Edge was in a real way. I had proven it maybe over and over, but maybe not to myself. Um, we got back and the first thing that happened was um, our, we talked to our bank and um, our banker said that we weren't going to go down because we couldn't pay our mortgages. And he um, said we didn't need to pay mortgages and interest for three months just to start with. Um, and they sent us a contribution. This is a local bank. Um, so it, it started, it, that conversation really um, in which there was a lot of crying, I think, um, really was like mind blowing, like, oh, actually a local bank is not the same thing as a big bank. Mm -hmm. um, and it went on from there, local funders, our members, um, we have about 400 members of Double Edge that 
um, share with us. Um, and they started contributing to us. Um, people, the co-ops, the local co-ops started um, like helping us, like we could get bulk food um, from them directly and et cetera. Um, so I think it was um, in the end more, it was so powerful and so inspirational. And I also think, um, I'm not sure if touring was in the future in any case um, as a, as a sustainable thing. I think local is the only way that we're going to tr transform our society. Um, and that doesn't mean that we can't have huge exchanges in other places. It just means that our focus is, needs to be on the local and whatever that means to people, um, because we really need to grow our communities and the strength of our communities. And I think for me, it's like totally been proven um, and over and over again, every day, there's, there's another effort, um, including um, people encouraging us to find a way to do a summer spectacle, which is what our popular version of our work is that we do a very large um, performance, tra indoor outdoor traveling performance around the farm um, every summer and we tour that as well to other communities. And people in the community are involved in that and they help us with that and they build things with, with us and um, crafts people, uh, electricians, plumbers. Um, so we've, we've been encouraged to find a way to do a, a safe and distant but um, something where people can get together and um, get, let's say, um, six feet apart all together. Um, so I think that um, just really changed the mindset and also our thinking that um, we can really have an impact in America we can change something in America, which we desperately need to do right now. Yeah, just the very fact that you exist, that this the direct democracy model exists and seems to be working, it's good, good for everybody. It's a, it's a, a significant a, a model um, in itself. Theater, if it's interesting, always is a model for something, or even on stage, something exists there that it could be in reality. We, think through our imagination and representation of um, a reality that for a fleeting moment is there, but it has uh, um, deep, uh, deep uh, influences and uh, consequences. And I uh, think um, that your work uh, uh, shows that there are alternatives. I remember Melanie Joseph, uh, who also was in our program, who created, by the way, a little network also to support artists. You can go on her, on her uh, foundry website that still exists, even though the foundry closed from and closed and closed again often. But Melanie said that uh, when she pre showed the book uh, that prayed about the history of the great history of the Foundry Theater, they said, New York City doesn't work. I tell young artists, don't stay here. Don't go through all of this, what we went through. Well, as it was already hard, it's hard to see a future. So both of you have models that are outside. You are in a community and you feel it's been rewarding. Also, um, Stephanie, you are out in, um, in, uh, in Hudson, you started in New York in a way. How, how has the experience been for you? Is both of your work maybe one of the many answers of uh, the impossibility of doing theater in the big cities and the metropolises? Is that uh, something where you say, yes, this is a new form. We were pioneers, but maybe you guys, you young artists or others think about this seriously, much more serious than perhaps you entertained a thought like this before. Our first season in New York City, um, the first of our annual 25 year seasons took place in a bar called the Char Charleston in Williamsburg. And we had clip lights and we had the bartender flicking the, the house lights on and off from behind the bar. And we did a series of 
performances there. And that was our first season. We did it all winter long. This year, um, going well, going back to, I guess, November of 2019, I began to uh, look into renting spaces for a May or June production of our 25th anniversary season. And I couldn't find anything under $12,000 a week. And that was just for the space. And that was a union space. And that doesn't include rehearsal and creating a show. That doesn't include any of the marketing that doesn't include any of the expenses that creating a new show with circus which has equipment and has you know li liability insurance and all of this stuff so it was all it was already doubtful that we were going to do it and that it was going to be possible and then this happened and it was almost a relief to not have to produce because we knew we were just we weren't gonna it wasn't going to be and frank you and i talked about this at the time I, I even contacted uh, New York City Parks Department to say, can we just do some free shows in the parks? We have to fulfill our obligation to our funders. We have mm -hmm. to we have to do this for our community and for ourselves. Like we need to do this, and we just, it just wasn't a way to do it. Even and the parks uh, said there's no place for you. Even the parks said we couldn't do it, and um, and so what you know I. I what Stacy has there, you know, a community, a place outside of, you know, the urban zone of economy um, is something that has long appealed to um, many of us in the circus community. And Frank, when you first convened us together with, um, with, um, you know, at the, at the Seagull um, this, this past year, many of us have continued that conversation. And I, and I just spoke with Angela Buccini and Yoni Kalai of the Muse who are looking to get out of the city and buy a big farm and create a circus compound. Um, it's something that we've fantasized about in many different ways across the community. Um, producing that, in that has its own issues, I think. Yeah. Um, and I wouldn't recommend that to young people. I think um, we started here in 1994. There was very little in Ashfield. It was a very um, economically depressed community. Um, we couldn't survive and neither could the community survive at the beginning. There was a lot of external work that had to be done. Um, we also learned that you can't just plop into a community and say you're here and everybody's going to be whatever. Um, th this is also, as in every rural community, it has a lot of different people um, and a lot of different ideas and values. So I think that's grown with us. Um, we have invested a lot of, um, well, our whole economy here. We're now the largest employer in Ashfield. Um, we've grown from eight people, five people moving here to, um, we have 22 people that work at Double Edge in our group right now and three properties, 14 buildings. Um, we started with one rundown barn. So I think, when we're talking about local, we, we could be talking about local in New York. We could be talking about a neighborhood. Any, any place that you go or that you are is- Everything in New York community. City is just not possible for circus artists and, and large scale theater. It's just, it's outside the, the realm of fiscally possible at this point in terms of real estate. And even if this global pandemic brings about some kind of restructuring of our monetary system, restructuring of real estate values, restructuring of our, our you know, aspirational standard of living, I still question the viability of an art form that takes so much space and so much specialized space in New York City and circus is that thing. There are four big like circus training spaces and there are dozens of small ones but almost 
almost all of them are, are on the verge of having to let go of their spaces. Which one are there spaces, the four? Circus Warehouse is a really big one. Streb is a really big one. Elizabeth's work, yeah. The, the Muse is a big one. Uh, and the, these, are, these, are the, these are the centers of, um, of entire communities of people. And there's overlap and, and we all know each other, but um, like each one of those spaces has its own culture and its own kind of mission and its own you know, audience that they speak to. Um, I, I certainly, you know, I, I agree with the idea of helicoptering into a place and just kind of expecting to take over. Um, but I, I also see like, you know, not running away from, but running to something else. And most, many of us, I, I was born and raised in New York City, but many people come to New York City from other places. And so the idea that you have to go to New York City to make art and to make theater and to make something of yourself, um, I think is, like you said, is an outdated idea. And like to go back to your own community with this gift of what you know how to do is something else. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's, there's something about humility there that um, Stacy, I think you're touching on um, and expectations, but really like, what, what do we do? What can we do? Um, I, th I think, you know, the vagary, the, the digital platform right now is another thing that so many of us are kind of grappling with. And especially if you're, if you're from the tradition of live theater and you know what that feels like and you know what that connection is and you know that, you know, what we really need right now is a healing and, a, and like a, a, a way to, um, talk about what we what this what this is bringing about in our society um, the digital platform and the and the screen is is something that none of us I, we don't embrace but we have to we have to also begin to learn you know how to use this this thing as as a way to get that feeling so I, I, wa I wanted to talk about that with you as also hmm. Stacey, are you, are you thinking, I know your work is also physical, it comes in a way out of Eastern European, about maybe the realm of a Krotowski tradition, uh, or Barba. So what do you think about screens? And the, are you on a farm? And are you thinking about producing work for a screen during COVID? Let's say this will go on for a year, nothing will happen. Your summer festival will not happen. Um, no, we're thinking of how to make our summer happen we are um we we talked about um what we wanted to do digitally and we decided we didn't want to why not um, we think that um our relevance is live um we can of course um offer our 38 years of archives, which we've been going through and had the opportunity to go through. And that's been incredible. Um, seeing some of our origins, um, our use of ruins um, in Central Europe, um, making us re-examine re how we got to where we are today. I think that's been really important for our group. Um, but um, essentially, we, we think that our contribution is right now is outdoors. Um, instead of trying to broadcast for performances for a lot of people, we, um, we decided to offer tours, um, like people could come to the farm and go on tours and walk in the fields and see the artwork that exists on the farm. So it's a small, intimate idea, but we've been getting about 20 people a week coming at different times um, just to be outside. Our parks around here even are totally full on the weekends, dangerously so. So we're trying to find a way to offer the natural sustenance without um, being dangerous for people. And we've, we've actually thought of how to do a physically dynamic 
um, spectacle that is that keeps its distance from the audience this summer. Um, we're going to take 12 locations on the farm and create a scene from our past work, our past outdoor work over the last 15 years. Um, and um, some of that will be more reflective than others. We have a labyrinth, we have a lot of different outdoor spaces that have been visually created. So we could even have five people in each space, um, even if we can't open up to a hundred people, we can open up to 30 people or 50 people. We think that people need to be um, in the natural environment right now in order to find um, courage to continue on. I think that there's many, many people who are doing great digital things and we're just not um, going to be great doing that. Although one of the um, great things that happened to us when we got back was that Jed Wheeler from um, Peak Performances at Montclair called me and said, I heard your tour got canceled um, I want you to come and I'm going to film your performance of Leonora and Alejandro for broadcast so that um, not just the people that didn't see it on tour, but the, the entire country or the world can see it. Um, so that was very uplifting, but that's an example of a professional, professionally done broadcast. Like that's not what Double Edge's work is. And I also think that um, even in like people like us or people that do make local work can um, make smaller things or be more imaginative about what we can do. Um, we're doing a lot of collaboration work right now with the Nipmuc community. Um, and what, other, say again, which community? The Nipmuc community. Can you say a bit? I don't, I'm not Nipmuc familiar. are indigenous people that oh, were yeah. mm -hmm. here on this land um, before us. Um, and we have created a space, one of our spaces at Double Edge for their um, practices. And um, we're doing a lot of work with them where they can um, re reignite their storytelling. Um, and the work that they did on the land. So it's an opportunity right now for them to really have a lot of space to develop those practices that they want to ultimately give to their youth, for instance. Mm -hmm. I good, think good. this is more than a theater opportunity. This is an opportunity for us to recognize that we need to uproot this country. We really need to change everything. And um, I hope that all the theater experiments will be part of that um, process. We, we can't wait any longer to have change here. Stephanie, your, your mic is off, uh, your microphone, yeah. Sorry, yes. I, I, I agree. I think that the experiments in theater are really experiments in healing and, and ritual that brings the community together and encourages folks who have just either through trauma or choice, just shut off their emotional capacity because it's too overwhelming. And theater invites you to just make yourself vulnerable, lay yourself bare. And the kind of suffering that's happening right now has to be honored, acknowledged and processed. And, and I think that art is the only way we're gonna get through this. Aside from, you know, reworking our, the way that American society um, is uh, is kind of organized. Um, we I just put a, a link in the chat. We did last night. Um, we're going to be doing a series of tiny little pop up parades. We've myself and two other um, 
community members are getting up on stilts um, and we're just kind of popping up in residential areas and um, they're just for people in their windows and one of the we last night the place that we started was the place in Hudson where the highest density residential units are that are um, many of them are section eight uh, one building is for folks who are um, on disability um, a lot of them are elders they've been stuck inside anyway many of them aren't mobile and um, the the response that came from behind the windows was Mm -hmm. overpowering and tremendous and you know many windows were blank but <laughs> uh for the for us in the street it was just like a way to connect and i and i think that is what i i hope that's what's happening when when you when when we talk about um you know what happens every evening at 7 p.m in new york city that's theater that's ritual you know, people are leaning out of their windows to bang pots and pans and that 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 kind of thing is so powerful and um, it doesn't have to be pretty and formal. Um, but to encourage those kinds of community uh, community gatherings, I think are very positive. And so when I when we talk about reimagining what theater is, I think there's um, you know, even more of an opportunity to make it less precious, to make it less um, kind of ensconced in, in an ivory tower and make it, you know, bring it back to the streets and make it accessible and make it, um, you know, let everyone claim it as, as they want. Yeah, this is, um, this is you're all right with everything you both say. Um, are you, Stephanie, are you guys thinking to Duke Digital work at all? Or you also say, no, our place is where we came from on the streets in unusual buildings, or do you think we will have to find, have a digital existence? We are doing a Monday night uh, for, for about 15 years. We've had an open mic night in New York City every month just for circus and variety artists. And that is now on, it's live streamed every Monday night. And we were very resistant to doing it, but what happens is is amazing. And you know, you can see in the chat on the side that people are participating, that it's meaningful to them to see it, that it's that it's live. Um, and then I have seen some really incredible innovation in the way that people are using the tools. You know, the the way that they're incorporating this screen and this screen, and and you know, it, it's just it's endless what what can possibly happen and it's just a whole it's like stacy you said it is a different medium that's certainly not my you know what i'm good at but i i'm surrounded by people who are willing to try it and and i have been very moved by some of the stuff i've seen i don't know if you guys um have become aware of this italian architect and set designer emanuele sinisi He's, he's got these incredible, he just keeps putting out these images of like what theater can look like now after the pandemic. One of the images is a, a bunch of cars parked in a circle with their headlights all facing in and you know two people engaged in dialogue in the center. Another image is um, a series of tents with people sitting inside in isolation but all watching a common thing. Um, I'm gonna paste this in the chat also. I'm not sure if the people watching this would have access, but he's on Facebook. And it's just, you know, I, I am so excited to reach outside of the circus tent and you know, like bridge to digital artists and bridge to these designers who are just conceiving of lots of different ways to bring people together in, in new formats. Mm -hmm. What are you guys, um, how do you guys spend your days at the moment? What do you do? And also, do you read? Do you write? Do you create shows in your mind? What's, what's happening? Um, I go to the theater every day. Um, I, Means your barn theater, your, 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 your theater. Yes, yeah. mm -hmm. the barn um, or different spaces. We've just made a big new kitchen 
I go to see the progress on the buildings that we're working on. Um, we meet, our ensemble has had uh, some pretty incredible meetings uh, that we never would have had time for if we had been working um, or on tour. Um, and I'm thinking a lot about how the work that I've been doing um, can be brought forward to this, not only to this moment, but to um, helping people find a path. Um, I'm thinking about how the tragedy, which means people are dying, our collaborators are dying, um, friends are dying. Um, that's, um, that's the tragedy of the moment um, is really different from the terrorism of the moment, which is um, our institutional governments, um, trying not to be um, overwhelmed by um, how to help um, against that terrorism. And I'm thinking about love and how love of all different kinds, um, love of my family, my friends, um, justice, love in justice, um, creating love, the nature, um, the world healing itself, those things can really be um, a power to um, overwhelm the terrorism that we are part of right now. Um, so anything that I do is in, I guess, um, trying to find my map between those three um, paths. Thank you, Stacy. Um, I I have to t I have to admit that I spent a good chunk of time this morning sobbing. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, Why? I think what put me over the edge was um, the final conviction of the murder or the murder trial of the the two who killed Ahmad Arbery. Um, I deleted my news app weeks ago. I haven't looked at it in two months. Uh, the stuff just comes across in the social media. I saw another image of a trans person who had been beaten by cops. Um, uh, there was an Amber Alert that came across my phone at 4 a.m. Um, and as much, you know, my, my day really starts the same every day. I spend a lot of time in meditation and contemplation because I just, um, I, uh, I'm a very sensitive, <laughs> fragile person. <laughs> I need a lot of maintenance um, before I can just go into the daily business of running an organization and, and trying to make sure that our, our staff gets paid. Um, but some of this stuff just seems too big. And, um, you know, like Bindlestiff's mission, mission is to foster community. And so what that means is that we try to, for us, it means making circus with other people um, and contributing what we can to our community. So I spend a lot of my time uh, working on ways to, uh, like we engage with youth here um, in Hudson and New York City. Um, we engage with, um, you know, we practice social circus, which is the same thing as art justice. You know, it's like a way of um, using what we do to help build community and, and build individuals, um, build ourselves. Uh, so a lot of my day is sitting in front of a computer and, um, and not like doing the physical practice that I love, but I'm, I'm trying to find the balance with that. I feel like, you know, the, these two and a half months have been more about Zoom than anything else. <laughs> um, but, you know, 
I, I have to remember, like, I'm an artist and I need to find joy and make joy. So like the, that little parade thing last night, we're doing another one on Mother's Day around the hospital here. We have 300 active cases of COVID in Columbia County. Um, our nursing homes are full of, of, of those cases. Um, we're going to just try to bring a little lift. So that's, that's where I need to end my day. I can start in tears, but I need to end my day feeling like I've done something. Mm -hmm. Are you guys reading something or listening to music or something that's, or looking at art, something that gives you uh, something that sets free energy? Or... I'm reading a history of um, the native peoples of New England and it's um, massive and overwhelming. Mm. Um, and I try to balance that with some things that aren't heartbreaking, um, like mystery books. Um, Which kind? Yeah. Historical mysteries. Mm -hmm. um, so I think um, we are also at Double Edge, we're singing a lot. Um, we ha our barn is 60 feet long, so it's big enough for all of us to be six feet apart singing. What do you sing? Um, well, mostly choral things from around the world, um, from here and from, from around the world. So people have, you have print out music sheets and you sing uh, yes. Schubert, Schubert or a... Uh, no, it's, it's more folk, uh, folk. than that, mm -hmm. I would say. Um, but give it an but, example. What? Oh, I'm not good at names yeah. of music. Yeah. Um, Sing something. And that's something that I am not leading at Double Edge. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah, you're participating. But <laughs> yes. still, that's amazing. Yeah. Stephanie, yeah. what do you, do, do you listen to something or do you read something or do you have, what do you meditate? Do you meditate to an image or sculpture? What do you do? I'm reading a lot of the Sufi poet um, Rumi right now, Rumi. Mm -hmm. and um, I've been listening to uh, the Red Bug. Yes. Yes, and um, I somebody just shared a link to um, uh, another Sufi, uh, a, a contemporary Sufi mystic who is talking about the nature of suffering, and um, but I'm also reading a lot uh, because I, I am creating a community um, kind of like what you're doing, Stacy. in the summer. I also am proposing something like that here in Hudson for our waterfront, like a community, a right that allows us to have closure with what we've missed or who has passed or the thing, the milestones that are like, kids aren't graduating from school this year. Our whole class of 2020 is, you know, all these seniors across, anyway. Uh, so I'm reading a lot about um, symbols and, and, and myth and renewal and, you know, the regenesis of, of life after, uh, life after death, um, the, the image of the Phoenix, because I, I, you know, have fire in my, in my house, um, is very powerful. So I'm reading a lot of, um, myths from all over the world about rising from the ashes and, and taking mm -hmm. flight. Mm -hmm. We are slowly I'm also reading um, the the Bacchae again, Euripides, mm -hmm. um, and planning um, my 40th anniversary performance of the Bacchae, going all the way through the farm with the ritual, women's ritual, and um, ancient ritual, and all of the women's rituals that have been. Um, cast aside over the years. So that's um, been pretty fun and exciting. And everybody's starting to get into that in the theater. And we're starting to run around the fields now that it's hopefully won't be snowing anymore. <laughs> yeah, it's been cold for a long time. Yes. And what do you, what would, what advice would you give if you would speak to Stephanie who was in the nightclubs spitting fire and Stacy starting out in Boston. Which what, what would you tell young artists? What do you, fo especially with COVID in mind, what would you tell them? What would you tell yourself? What would you wish you had known at that time? And is there something in it maybe for also for our listeners? 
Well, we are actually starting mentorships of young artists right now. We're working with Greenfield Community College. We're working with about 10 artists who have been here, young people, and now they don't have any place to go um, to do their work. Um, their schools are shutting down, et cetera. So we, we've started to open up to, um, right now we're doing online mentorships with them um, where they can be training. Um, they are creating their performances um, in sometimes in their bedrooms because that's all they have. Um, but they're still creating work um, and we're, we help advise them. And then hopefully during the summer, uh, they will be able to come here at different times and work outside. Um, so what we're, we're trying to develop some fellowship. Yeah, but practice. what do you say to them? What do you tell them? What do you tell these or what you do? That they, first of all, um, their, their hope is to continue creating and to get the energy to create. And I think that's what we see as our role is if we can witness them creating, they may have a little bit more energy to actually do that. Because I think part of this stay at home and being in the cities is that it's confinement. Um, so it makes you tired and lazy and it's not even laziness. It's really just exhaustion. Um, so we're trying to witness that they can do something, maybe an hour a week um, of something that they feel is, is deeper or um, more inventive for themselves and that they do have a place where they can go outside and they can um, create outside. And, mm. and I think, um, again, just want to wrap back to the theme of local that I think um, wherever, whatever is local, I think there, there isn't any way that people can survive and create without a community anymore. So um, that's the thing. And and I also want to say that we're telling them that they really have to think about justice, um, that justice goes along with, work on justice goes along with any creative process now, because otherwise everything is falling apart. Right. Thank you, Stacey. Stephanie. If I, if I could talk to, you know, just even myself uh, 25, 35 years ago, I would say, look around and see who's next to you and, and ask them to teach you what they know. And maybe you can share what you know with them. Um, and that would have meant I probably would have stayed. Um, I mean, well, you know, I was born and raised in New York City, but I, I could have, um, I could have uh, stayed, you know, where I was and didn't, you know, what you have is enough, your ideas are, good follow your intuition um don't you don't have to go someplace else you don't have to to be someplace else more you know to be more important or to be more involved um like your art is where you are and um i don't know i just found that you know when we toured around so much and we would go to salt lake city or lincoln nebraska and everybody wanted to come to new york as we've said before and it's like no the opportunity is right here and there are elders in your community and there are, are living working artists in your community like what can you do together you don't have to go anywhere else and i think that that speaks again to that local idea and um rootedness like sense of place and and um enriching the life of your community by adding to it and not taking away from it um yeah and just keep keep at it that's what i would say <laughs> just yeah, keep at yeah, it no incredible this is very significant and we should really listen to what you both say and especially create community and don't take away give and um that really is uh, you know of, of, of great 
significance. Both of your work uh, is intertwined with your life. It does show that it's not a career decision to become uh, an actor or director that is about getting the Hollywood swimming pool or the roles in film and uh, that theater is only for those who you don't even make it of him. No, it's a decision how to spend your life. It's a decision, a way of living. Just being an artist is a provocation already in the United States, especially to its questioning realities. It's a very significant statement just that you say, we are an artist, we run a company, we do a theater, you, or more, you do the impossible and you question the reality. This in itself is a significant contribution as Gertrude Stein said, for theater and getting together. Just the fact that people get together, talk to each other, meet at a point, look at something, talk about it, half of it. This is what theater is all about. And um, so you put your life, uh, you threw your body into the lives and, and, and stand with your whole uh, um, decades of work behind ideas and they are not papers written or shows given. It is something that is real and there's something to look at. And I think for many of us, maybe also to really question it. There are two solutions we both found that do work and it's local and they are serving communities and they also fields of work that has not been, they have not been explored as much as they should be and can be, I think, uh, Stacy's um, idea of walks uh, and for in nature. Perhaps also you might create, you know, the idea of a remedy protocol, other little, little uh, uh, radio plays that people can listen to, and you guide them through the nature. So that is such things they then you guide them to, and uh, so there will be games uh, that basically you you create and help people to see things they might not think. And I think Stephanie's idea to be on stilts and that people look out of their windows. So instead we go to theater, you are where you are, almost like in an opera, you have your private loge, you look down to what happened, now your room is it, and you create um, something we always knew already that theater is a, a backdrop. You don't need to build a stage, a set design theater already is one of the great discoveries of the 60s and 70s, but now it becomes a new uh, 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 significance and that and the people behind the windows open the windows and share and it's local it's where they live and they see something that uh, for a moment you know plays with the idea of what's real and what's not what's imagined and it's a significant contribution and that you both care so deeply that the people around you the elderly the young people people who the disadvantage and there's something that theater always has done it's uh, uh, what it does and this might make so very very different from the many other art forms and that's why it's so great and that's why it is so significant to participate it keeps you young it live music it's clear live theater will keep you engaged and um and it is uh, both thanks to people like you who, who who do such work and again thank you for taking the time and sharing so honestly um, the moment uh, we are in now, and uh, we heard from so many artists all around the world, as you know, we heard from Egypt, Lebanon, Hong Kong, uh, Romania, Hungary, Germany, Italy, often so that is an important contribution you made, but also a reality here in the United States through your work, even so it's not always in the center focus of what people think about when it comes to theater. So thank you. That's a significant contribution. So as women in the field, what you keep together, there seems to be often women who care and who keep uh, the, the organizations going. So thank you in the name for everybody for that. And I hope that also both of you might have time. I know that once in a while you guys listen, but next week we also have an incredible uh, a lineup again from the theater artists from around the world. Ismail Mohammed from South Africa, from Johannesburg, the great market theater, mm -hmm. will tell us what's going on in Johannesburg. Natalia Rosbit from the Ukraine, a playwright who also has been at the Seagull, she will tell a little bit what happens in that country where it's been denied that there even the virus exists. Um, we have Nizar Subai and Fida Zaidan from Palestine um, who will give us an update on uh, what's happening uh, What's happening there. Roberta Estrela Dalva and uh, Dion Carlos, Carlos from Brazil, uh, to, to, to significant worker in the field will tell us what's happening in that uh, country that also um, seems to struggle anyway, but especially now during, during this. And then in Eduard Elvis uh, Voma and Ermin Yolo from Cameroon um, will uh, talk to us. Uh, Eduard has been at the season also for the Penwell Voices and uh, he's a significant worker in an African context. So we, we really look forward to hear these voices from around the world. Thank you guys for listening at home. If you 
uh, open your windows or not yet if it's warm enough, but it means a lot for us so that you take the time to listen, that you listen to the voices of artists from artists all around the world. As far as we know, we are perhaps the only institution in the US or in the States, perhaps also in Europe that can really creates new uh, programming every day. Um, and um, that's something that um, we committed to. We have always done that at the Siegel to bridge academia and professional theater, international and American theater. And I think uh, right now, um, I need to hear these voices what keeps me sane and helps me. So it's a big uh, thing you all did do for us. Thank you for, for, for participating. Thank you for listening at our audience. Hope you will join us again. Thanks to HowlRound, great HowlRound to host us every day in the week. I know it's a big undertaking and um, Thea and VJ and other things you do for us. And of course the Siegel team, Sun Young and, um, and Jackie and uh, Andy, and we lost May, one of our collaborators who had to go back on a military plane to Lebanon because the State Department said, this is it, you're a Fulbright student, you have to go back, it's an unprecedented time. Jackie had a death in her family now. So we are all um, uh, together in this. And I think it shows that we all do care and that you both also show that you really do care about the world and that we are connected. So thank you all. And for the listeners, I hope that you will uh, um, reflect on what both of them said. Stay local, go outside the centers, create a community, be part of it, give, not just take, and it will also give back to you. So thank you all, and I hope you will have a good weekend. Stay safe, uh, wear a mask, and stay tuned, and I hope to be with you again next week. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank stay you. Bye-bye. Such a pleasure to meet you, Stacey. You too. I look forward to um, connecting offline at some point. Great. Yeah. Yes. Be well. You too.